So hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. David Thicket, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, David Thicket has a degree in Natural Sciences, PhD in Archaeological Conservation and Chemistry, and has worked for two years in industrial ceramics research. He joined the British Museum in 1990, specializing in preventive conservation and in organic materials conservation research. He joined English Heritage in 2003 as senior conservation scientist, mainly researching preventive conservation. Recent projects have focused on historic house environments, pollution and damage, collections, demography and epidemiology, non-destructive testing, microclimate frames, and optical coherence tomography. He's an assistant coordinator of the ICOMCC Metals Working Group and an ex-coordinator of the Preventive Conservation Working Group. He sits as a UK expert to the European standards CENTC C46 conservation standards and is a director, directory board member is a directory board member of the Indoor Air Quality and Infrared and Raman Users Groups. He has published over 100 research papers and co-supervised six PhDs. The title of today's talk, as you all know, is on the nature and managing silver tarnish. The display of silver collections will often require careful, careful consideration of aesthetic preferences for surface finish to be balanced with the resources required for cleaning and the potential for loss of surface material detail or decoration. Hence, methods to reduce the rate of tarnish formation are a priority, particularly for collections containing a large number of highly polished decorative silver objects. These include understanding the composition of the tarnish layer, understanding the process of tarnishing and the environmental factors that drive the reactions, assessment of the perception of tarnish and the methods of passive and active control of tarnish formation and proper storage methods. This paper presents a holistic examination of the nature of tarnish and the variety of approaches to its management. Before I invite David to start his presentation, I would I, I request all of you to please mute your microphones. We will be taking the question answers right after the presentation. So please do keep typing those in the chat box. I'll be taking up those at the end. And also please type in your name, organization name and email ID. We would love to know who all have joined us today. So David, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and for giving this presentation today. Over to you. Thank you. And, and thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, quite thrilled to be uh, presenting to all of you today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the nature of silver tarnish, what it is or what we find in heritage contexts uh, in Europe at least, and how that influences the way that we undertake preventive conservation. And most of what I'm going to talk about is preventive conservation. I won't be talking in any depth about interactive, interventive conservation with silver. So silver tarnish is a problem that I'm sure you've all uh, come across, we have a darkening of the surface. These layers are actually not very thick. Even after 15 or 20 or 30 years, the tarnish layer is less than about two or three microns. And a micron is a thousandth uh, of a millimeter. But because uh, certainly within most of you, we have the preference for clean, shiny sir silver, uh, that means uh, that somebody has to clean this disfiguring but thin tarnish layer away. And just another example of an object that we know hasn't been cleaned for at least uh, 25 years. Now, the cleaning process is quite intensive and most of the major museums in Europe have the equivalent of one full-time person who does nothing but clean uh, silver. Uh, thankfully, generally not the same person. And some objects uh, do take a lot of time. Uh, this is the Portuguese silver, piece, uh, silver centerpiece in Apsley House. It's 14 and a half meters silver, and it takes approximately three and a half person years to remove the lacquer, clean the silver, 
and put another layer of lacquer on. And we need to undertake that process about every uh, 15 years. Some objects are not amenable to silver cleaning or silver polishing because certainly with the physical polishers, whenever we clean the silver, we do remove a small amount of silver. We wouldn't be able to do that uh, on the gilded surfaces uh, this object has several of. That's also problematic where we have fine detail, which this object does have. We quite quickly uh, remove this if we cleaned it too frequently. And from sort of the 18th century onwards, we have a, a, an amount of plated silver, uh, usually copper with a thin layer of silver on the surface and uh, the slide in the bottom left. You can see what happens if you clean that several times. We eventually just go straight through the plating and you can see the uh, copper underneath. Uh, and similarly, there are some objects that we just, at the moment, really aren't able to clean. Uh, this is Japanese print. Uh, this was silver. It's now uh, blackened and it's totally changed the reading of the print but there isn't a safe method for cleaning the silver that won't affect the paper or the pigments uh, underneath. So just, just a word to say that you know, preventing this is much better if we can, although in reality, we're only really able to slow the process down, at least in display situations. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the nature of silver tarnish. And in order to do that, we have to be able to analyze what this black layer is actually formed of. And if you read most of the literature, it will tell you it's predominantly silver sulfide from hydrogen sulfide uh, in the air. But I'm gonna talk initially about a number of different techniques we can uh, analyze this layer with. I'm gonna talk about the ones in red and I'll go through them in a, a tiny bit of detail later i'm not going to go into this deeply but there's a few things you need to understand and one of the important things is how deep they analyze into the silver so something like colorimetry or voltammetry we think does the whole depth of the tarnish doesn't matter how thick it is a scanning electron microscope will go down a will analyze from a depth of about one micron and that is approximately 10,000 layers of silver sulfide if this was all silver sulfide. And I should say there are different ways of defining that number of layers. Uh, we can use some other techniques that are much more sensitive to just the surface. Photoelectron spectroscopy, which goes down about five nanometers. A nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, approximately 50 layers. And the most sensitive thing that we have available at the moment is secondary ion mass spectrometry. And that literally will analyze a single atomic layer. And its detection limit is about 2% of that single atomic layer. Uh, so that's about 0.1 of a nanometer. So uh, you see on the image on the right, we have some silver coupons out there. We use these a lot to assess environments. And if you put them in, your showcases, some of your galleries, maybe your stores, and leave them for about a year. After that period, you can probably see differences in performance. Some of them will be quite darkened, some of them uh, much less so. So as you can see that uh, by eye, but you can do it a more, much more accurate measure of that surface color using an instrument called a colorimeter. And here's a picture of one on the uh, left. And what that does is it translates the surface reflectance into three numbers, three coordinates uh, on this scheme, L star, A star, B star. So as each color will be a point somewhere on here. And the advantage is it's very precise. It doesn't matter who's looking at it, like a silver coupon might, uh, and it can be very accurate. And you can possibly just see in here on this object we have a melanex mask with holes cut in it to put the colorimeter in exactly oops, getting ahead of myself in exactly the same place so as we can get a very accurate measurement and if we do that measurement carefully it's about a hundred times more sensitive than the human eye to changes in color so as we can pick things up much earlier with it and when we get the numbers they're more accurate they're more reproducible providing careful. 
The second technique which we can do uh, certainly on coupons is uh, electrochemical stripping. So as we put the coupon, uh, that's the coupon there, in a solution, uh, we attach it to an instrument called a potentiostat and that changes the voltage and measures the current uh, as it changes that, that voltage. And if we have a clean coupon, uh, so as we're going to sweep the voltage, the E value on here, and if we have a clean coupon, eventually we start to break down the water in the solution and produce hydrogen, but we have a pretty flat, uh, slight curved line with a clean coupon, just silver. If, which we're much more interested in, we have a silver coupon with a corrosion product on the surface, we actually start to see peaks like this. And the voltage, the potential where that peak starts tell us what, tells us what the compound is, and the area under the peak tells us how much is there. And this is quite a useful technique because those silver tarnish layers are very thin, so as we need a sensitive piece of equipment to be able to tell what's uh, going off. So what comes out of this is essentially a series of peaks, and we can relate those to which compounds they are, silver chloride, silver sulfide, silver oxide, and we can tell how much is, is there. We can put our silver coupons or possibly small objects such as coins and jewellery into a scanning electron microscope. Uh, it will only take small objects because we have to put them into a vacuum chamber and there's a detector on there. We shoot electrons at the surface and x-rays come off and we will end up with this spectrum on the bottom left. The bottom scale is essentially an energy scale we get a series of peaks, and the peaks tell us what the elements are, silver, chlorine, sulfur, oxygen, uh, in this case. And for that instrument, we're analyzing about a micron, uh, 10 to the minus six meters of depth. If the tarnish is just on the surface, uh, so it's maybe there's you know, a thousand layers of silver sulfide, the next 9,000 layers will be silver, and we'll just get a combination of the two. So we go to a depth of one micron, but we can analyze thinner layers, but we'll get less uh, useful information just compared to the silver. So he's quite interested in using these more surface sensitive techniques. I don't have a picture of this instrument. It's not something we have ourselves. We have to go to a uh, commercial firm to have this analysis done. And it's probably something you can only really do on silver coupons. This is photoelectron spectroscopy. Uh, it's a different, it fires x-rays, electrons come off. Again, it's an energy scale. The positions of the peaks tell us what's there, but it tells us a little bit more than just whether it's sulfur. Uh, the peaks are in slightly different places for different forms of sulfur. So silver sulfide has a different position to a sulfate, to a sulfide, to a thiosulfide. So it tells us how much is there and what the kind of species are. It's much more surface sensitive, five nanometers, so it's approximately 50 layers of silver. Uh, silver. And then finally, uh, this is secondary ion mass spectrometry. Again, a piece of equipment we have to go elsewhere to use, it's not cheap, uh, but it is incredibly sensitive. Uh, and this will look at a single layer. Uh, on the surface in one uh, way of running it. Uh, you actually bombard the surface with uh, galenium ions, and you can either do that just to look at the surface, or you can drill a very small hole into your, into your uh, sample and get a depth profile uh, through there, which we'll see a little bit later. So, less about instrumentation. Uh, first part of what I'm going to talk about is some a series of experiments where we looked at a number of showcases that had mainly silver in them. We were sure there was nothing in the showcases that would tarnish silver. So as we tested these information panels, these information panels, these boards, etc. And we used uh, something called the Oddi test, which I, uh, I guess you probably have heard about. 
and we just put a sample of the material in a glass tube with a bit of water uh, and some coupons including silver put it in an oven at 60 degrees C and after four weeks see if there's any tarnish on the silver so as we knew all of those materials uh, were fine and just as an example of something that you uh, might not expect to cause tarnishing of silver this is a piece of archaeological iron uh, it's actually an object but there are is sulfur gas sulfur compounds in there that will tarnish silver uh, and you can see the tarnished and clean silver coupon uh, this side so for this what we did is put out a piece of silver a glass slide to collect dust and I'll talk about that a bit later and some of these uh, diffusion tubes uh, and these measure hydrogen sulfide and carbonyl sulfide which we know are the two main gases that people have said cause silver tarnish so as we put these out in the series of showcases in the gallery and also uh, externally uh, but shielded from uh, rain and these are the results uh, that we see so as we have hydrogen sulfide and carbon sulfide concentrations they're very low parts per trillion a lot lower than most of the pollutants you'd normally worry about in air and the colorimetry results with an increase in uh, B star showing tarnish and some of the showcases are much better than others showcases are always better than the gallery and the gallery is always better than the outside air uh, and we did this over uh, two separate uh, exposures in those cases but i've got similar results from several other locations and what's quite interesting with this and is quite different from most other metals and pollutants is the tarnish doesn't seem to be related to the amount of hydrogen sulfide and carbon sulfide in the air. The tarnish is very variable outside gallery showcase, but the levels of carbon sulfide and hydrogen sulfide are similar at least. So it doesn't seem to be related to that concentration, which is what we'd expect. And what we think is happening here is because the silver surface is so incredibly reactive if a hydrogen sulfide model molecule uh, gets anywhere near the surface it will react and it's gone it's out of the air and what we think that means is that we're not the or we, sh we shouldn't be worried about concentration what we need to be worried about is the actual flow of air over the object surfaces and the problem is that certainly within the showcase those air flows are very low they're very difficult to detect uh, with that but it does seem quite fundamental that we're not worried about the concentration like most pollution and most metals acetic acid and lead chloride and uh, hydrogen chloride and iron uh, copper alloys it's something else and airflow might be part of it another possibility is that what we're actually seeing uh, is to do with particles on the surface and I uh, at one point looked at a lot of objects in the British Museum about 400 we had them in and what we often saw was this kind of thing under a microscope so as you have a particle here and you've got obvious bands of tarnish occurring around it so as the particle is either bringing something that's causing the tarnish or enabling the tarnish to uh, happen and that's, I've seen that quite widely on objects if you look at them under a microscope at the early stages of tarnish. Eventually, these just add, you know, all join up. Uh, and studying particles is quite difficult because they're very different in different parts of the world and sometimes even in the same building. And these are some results of different kinds of chemistry of particles at buildings in uh, Lisbon. And you can see, you know, without looking at the detail, there's a lot of different between them which means experimentally it's quite difficult to study the impact uh, but one thing we can do and I've mentioned about putting coupons out is if we put them at 45 degrees the top surface of the silver and the bottom surface have, a, have the same relative humidity the same temperature and the same pollutant gases and we measured this and checked it 
but there's a big difference in the particles that are depositing on the surface. There'll be a lot more on the top and a lot less on the underside. There won't be zero, but there will be a lot less. And if we look at our coupon with the electrochemical reduction, but use this kind of holder, we can analyze one side of the coupon and then analyze the other side of the coupon separately. So we can look at the top surface and the underside. And when we do that, we get some quite interesting uh, results. And I, I put the uh, reference at the bottom if people are interested in uh, looking at this later. So in most of the rooms that we've analysed, there's a lot more silver tarnish on the top surface and the underside, between two and even four times as much. For showcases, if they're quite leaky, and this number by the side is the air exchange rate, which we'll talk about a bit later, we get an effect, but it's not as strong. But once we start to see quite uh, airtight showcases, 0.4 per day, 0.8, there really isn't an effect. So the dust is definitely having an impact. And quite a dramatic one. This is a lot more than I expected to uh, see when we uh, looked at so looking at the analysis of the coupons now, this is with the SEM and we just get the elements that are present. So there's obviously silver there, there's sulfur as we'd expect, there's actually a lot of chloride, chloride, chloride and there's actually almost as much chloride as sulfur, which we didn't really expect, and there's actually a lot more silver oxide than there is of those other two. Uh, species. So it's quite clear we've got a mixed tarnish, at least where I've looked at where I've looked at in the British Museum and in other locations around the UK. It's not just silver sulfide. And to look at this in a little bit more detail, we looked at a number of coins, and coins and medals are a little bit are quite interesting in certainly within the UK, within Europe, because unlike most objects. The patina on the coin, the tarnish, is very highly valued. So they would never clean this off uh, as a coin collector. When we have coins in the museum that, you know, have been, you know, we knew we know they were collected quite quickly. They're not, they've not been underground at any point, so they've not had conservation clearance. And when we look at those coin patterns, and we can put the coins in the SEM, uh, what we see is that for most of them, there's actually more chloride in there, the darker, slightly darker yellow above the line, than sulfur. So most of the patinas that have formed naturally in the environment, I've got more chlorine in them than sulfur, even in London, which is some distance away from the sea, but you never get that far away from the sea in uh, the UK. So where is this chloride coming from? And uh, these are some suggestions. Deposition of dust, gases in the air, handling. Within the museum, people are supposed to wear gloves, but we have fingerprints on objects that prove that sometimes they don't. Possibly from their previous use, coins obviously, and conservation. Uh, some of the treatments we use can involve uh, chloride. And we looked at dust in the British Museum. We took those glass slides and we measured the amount of dust uh, with a, a number called soiling units, which I'm not going to go into. But what we could also do is extract those uh, glass slides in water, and see how much chloride, nitrate, sulfate is falling onto the surface. And certainly there is chloride in every sample. Quite small amount, but it is depositing slowly onto the, the surface. And some another museum in London, just to show this isn't something that's purely about the British Museum, and this is actually a museum that's got air conditioning. So it's even the filtration in the air conditioning is not stopping this chloride depositing onto the surface uh, inside the showcases. Uh, we can look at the chloride gas. We can use the diffusion tube and analyze it in a different way. And we did get some levels of uh, chloride gas in the air. So that is definitely another potential source. Going back to a bit closer in analysis of those silver layers. So this is the XPS. So we have chlor and it pretty much agrees. We have chloride, 
We've now found sulfate there as well as sulfide. We've got the oxide, which we had before, but there are also two, or at least two types of different organic carbon on the surface. Uh, one of which, the blue one, has oxygen in it as well. So it's an even more uh, mixed uh, varnish. And if we look at the depth profiling with uh, SIMS, and the time will relate to depth, but we don't know the exact relationship here. This is the surface. This is the edge of the tarnish layer, we think. And this is silver. This is a carbon species, and we can see it's all the way through the depth of the tarnish. It's not just at the surface, though there's a lot more of it at the surface. It's right the way through the tarnish. So there's a, you know, some kind of organic carbon species tied up in that tarnish. And what, so what can we conclude? The tarnish layer is mixed. It's not just silver sulfide. We've got organics all the way through that layer, and that fits in from, with some observations from conservators cleaning coins. We frequently use cellulose nitrate lacquers, so the first thing they do is use acetone to take the lacquer off. And what they found was quite often when they did that, that removed a lot of the tarnish. And if it was just silver sulfide, that really shouldn't happen. But the fact we've got an organic chemical all the way through, it gives the acetone some way of doing that. And what's probably quite important for what we're doing for preventive conservation is the tarnish rate isn't proportional to either hydrogen sulfide or carbon sulfide or both of them. And there seems to be an impact of the very low airflow rates around objects that we might need to take into account. And I'll uh, show you in a second how we do that. So we found a number of things we've measured that the tarnish rate isn't proportional to, what actually does it rely on? And one thing that's quite clear is the more tightly sealed showcase, the lower the uh, tarnish rate. These are measurements uh, from a showcase, and we uh, squirt, put a carbon dioxide logger in there, squirting some carbon dioxide, and just watch it decay. As the air moves out of the showcase, the carbon dioxide moves out. And with this kind of measurement, which was done over six days, we can say the air exchange rate is about 0.1612. So it's quite a tightly sealed showcase. Air, about just over a tenth of the air in the showcase will move in or out of it uh, during the day. So as we have a way of measuring this, we then went and measured a load of showcases, got some silver coupons in them, measured the tarnish rate. So the first set of results, and this was published in 2006, uh, show essentially if we ignore the two values with silver on them for the moment, we can see as the air exchange rate goes up, the tarnish rate goes up. So the tighter the showcase, the slower the tarnish rate. These two showcases had a lot of silver in them. And what uh, we think is happening there is the gases or dust is split between all the silver surface in there. If you've got a single silver object, a lot of it, the gap, a lot of it will react with the silver. If you've got 30 silver objects, it splits the tarnish between them. So if it's possible, one very good strategy for slowing tarnish on display is to put all of your silver objects together. Sometimes that's not possible, sometimes it can be. And then uh, work we're publishing recently, a much larger number of measurements, and we do see this uh, slowing of the tarnish rate as we make the showcases tighter and tighter. The red uh, squares are where we've done measurements on where we've had flat silver surfaces uh, for objects, as you saw earlier, and one thing that's quite good about the coupons is the objects are tarnishing more slowly than the coupons in the same atmosphere. So that's quite a positive thing with using uh, coupons. You'll get to find out changes before you see them on the objects. Okay, so making showcases tighter and tighter is a good way of slowing down silver tarnish. But if you've got an existing showcase, there's a limit to what you can do. 
and I've just run a course in uh, the US about how we go about uh, tightening up showcases and uh, slowing these things down. And but for many other metals and many other objects, we tend to use absorbent. So the image at the bottom is activated charcoal granules in a container that was used in a series of wooden showcases in the British Museum to mop up acetic acid that would have affected things like the shells. What we know about how silver, or now know about how silver reacts, this is probably not a great approach. And we've actually done some trials with. Uh, this is a zinc oxide absorber for hydrogen sulfide, and it doesn't work hardly at all in this situation. And the reason it doesn't work is, if we look at the image on the right, this is a typical uh, modern type showcase. So it's a glass and steel box with the, an opening door at the front. And uh, if we measure how much air is leaking through that door, which are the two bands, you can see most of it's happening around the door. If it's well built, it won't happen anywhere else. So was, and for a showcase like that, we could put the silver objects on the baseboard or maybe on the backboard. And if we're going to try and put an absorbent in there again, we'd probably try and hide it. So as we probably put it either below the objects or behind the backboard so as you couldn't see it. And the problem is that the gases come in from those doors at the front and they have to go over the silver object to get to the absorbent, which means there won't be any hydrogen sulfide in them because it will already have reacted with your uh, silver surface. So the absorbent, even if it's very good at pulling these gases out of the air, is not going to be very effective. And unfortunately, we trialled that. And it, does, uh, it is uh, that way. The one instance that this might well work is where you have this kind of uh, desktop showcase I'm showing on the left. So it's a, a five-sided glass hood hinged at the back that sits down and it's quite easy to get absorbent along all of the uh, edges by the seals so that the, get, the air's got to go over the absorbent before it gets to the silver and that can work quite successfully. But most showcases aren't the shape, so for most of them, just putting an absorbent sat in there, what we call passively, uh, unfortunately isn't going to be effective. Another approach is to use a pump. And uh, these have been used for at least 30 years. They've gone through a whole series of uh, improvements. I've seen showcases with just a little aquarium pump for uh, oxygenating your fish, uh, which works perfectly well. You draw the air through, through the absorbent and then blow fresh air into the uh, showcase. We've uh, recently started using these particular units. Uh, they've got activated charcoal in them and a HEPA dust filter. What's quite useful with them is they have this separate control unit and we can vary the flow rate on here but there's also a warning light if the pump stops working one of the real drawbacks of this approach is everything fails whatever machine you buy will pack in and if you don't know it's failed then you're not getting any protection with this unit the red light comes on if the pump uh, fails and then the clean air uh, comes out of the black tubes and is fed into the uh, showcase. And we've been running trials with these. So as we've been measuring the silver tarnish rate in the room outside and in the showcase of silver coupons. And we've also used these uh, instruments that are, uh, have become available in the last five or six years. Uh, they're called air core. They're unfortunately quite expensive, but they're very sensitive and very accurate. And essentially what you have is two very carefully machined tracks of silver here and here. One is covered in a lacquer so it doesn't react, the other one is open to the air. It tarnishes. As it tarnishes, the thickness of pure silver decreases very slightly, and you can measure that with resistance of the two uh, tracks. And the advantage is you can measure a silver tarnish rate of or a thickness of tarnish on the surface of 0.1 nanometers, which is very, very thick. The very early stages and it takes a reading every 30 minutes and you can uh, download it. So
so we have these pumps in a lot of different showcases with different sizes, different air exchange rates, different amounts of silver, and we're just running that. And what we've done is we set the flow rate to be about five times the air exchange rate because experimentally we've shown that seems to give the best effect. And if I just blow up the uh, two right hand columns, the results, those, the one in purple is our silver. Uh, coupons. The one in, on the right is using the air core and the numbers don't exactly agree. They're done as a percentage against the room. So 95% means the tarnish rate in the showcase is a 20th of that in the room. But they all show very good reductions in silver tarnish. So the pumps are working well. The figures in brackets are where we have that showcase without the pump. And although we get a bit of reduction, nowhere near as good as having the pump and the absorbent so if you really need to keep silver on display clean this is about the best uh, way of doing it providing you've got electricity providing you can keep the pumps uh, running okay just want to talk for a few minutes about storing silver uh, and stores and once we put silver into a store, there's often a lot of other things in there in terms of collection that can cause silver to tarnish. And I've just listed them here. And sometimes we even have objects where the silver will be tarnished by parts of the same object. So the classic example is uh, military uniforms, they often have a lot of silver braid on them. And the dark dyes on the textile or the wool sometimes will cause that braid to uh, tarnish if you keep it in an enclosure, a showcase, or a quite tightly sealed store room. And what the graph shows is the corrosion rate measured in a number of store rooms on the left and museum rooms, galleries on the right. And what you can see is really the store rooms aren't any better than having it in the gallery. So just putting it in the store doesn't seem to slow tarnish down. And sometimes it can speed it up. Uh, and because of these uh, two, two things, we recently started uh, putting a lot of our silver objects that are in storage into these aluminium foil bags, and they're sealed with a self-adhesive aluminium uh, tape. And putting one of those air core loggers into one of these bags showed us that in 18 months we couldn't detect any tarnish so the tarnish rate is less than 0.1 nanometers in 18 months and it probably means uh, that if you are looking at a visual change to the silver you're probably talking hundreds of years before you would see anything if anything happened we didn't detect anything but the other thing that's really interesting is for objects like the uh, uniform, where you have something in there that you would expect to be a problem, these also, the silver on these also doesn't tarnish when you put them into this sealed bag. We don't know exactly why that is, but it's quite an important uh, thing if you're looking at storing your silver long term. Now, the other thing uh, that has come up recently. Uh, is there is a material called corrosion intercept, which is a plastic with lots of very fine copper particles in it, uh, and it's sold for protecting metals, etc. And at the recent uh, ICOM CC metals meeting in 2019, Ian McLeod gave a poster which was presented, and what they'd done is taken uh, some Southeast Asian textiles that have lots of beautiful. Uh, silver threads on them uh, but are very difficult to clean because of this problem with the conservation techniques uh, damaging the textile if you clean the silver and what they did was just put them in these corrosion intercept bags for two years and what they found is for all of them the tarnish was removed from the silver and the reason is that copper sulfide is much more stable than silver sulfide so it's in the long term the sulfur will move from the silver into, onto the copper uh, particles. We thought this was a really uh, good idea. It's a really good way of doing conservation if, if you have the time to wait uh, without having to use any chemicals or even touch the objects beyond uh, you know, careful handling. And previously, 
uh, we'd done work where we put coupons out in six or seven different types of environment around the UK and we had those tarnished coupons that had been exposed for a year and we put them into the this is a corrosion intercept bag which was heat sealed and we put them in initially for four months because the way most of our properties open is they're open in the summer they close for the winter so silver objects go into the safe for four months and this is what we saw we tried it at different temperatures seven degrees 17 24 to see if that had an effect and so these are some coupons from Bodsworth Hall the change in B star with that initial exposure was 3.55 after four months most of that had gone back to the color that the silver was uh, to begin with maybe not fully but a long way and that was the same with uh, well over half of the, the uh, coupons however for some of them we didn't really see any change at all so it's all the end the b star to begin with was 3.1 after four months it really hadn't changed there within the errors of the measurement so as we hadn't reduced that silver and then for the absolute plate one down here we had caused a reduction it was about halved but it wasn't down to zero so maybe if we left that longer that would go we don't know we have some tests running at the moment with these ones that didn't reduce to see if we leave them longer will they start to go but they they haven't as yet and then the final thing we tried to do was just relate that to the environment was there some differences in the environment that changed the tarnish that made it work or not and i color coded these so the red ones are the ones that didn't change the yellow uh, yellow one is the one that changed, changed a bit and it would seem and this is not perfect it certainly needs a lot more work perhaps having a lot of chloride deposition uh, means the tarnish is less likely to be reduced by this which makes sense if it's a chloride tarnish it's not going to undergo the same reaction and that works well for two of them but the chloride levels for all the end are not that high and again perhaps having higher ozone means the tarnish is less likely to be uh, reduced but it's not a perfect agreement with our our measurements uh, so certainly more work to do with that but if you can afford to wait and can afford that maybe it won't work and you'll have to do some conservation afterwards it is a you know really interesting and potentially very useful uh, technique I'm going to finish uh, talking about lacquers. So if you have something on open display, if you have it in a showcase that you know is really problematic, you sometimes put a lacquer on the surface. And uh, I've tested about 27 lacquers through my uh, career. Only three of them were acceptable to the curators. And one of the ones that uh, we keep using is this uh, cellulose nitrate lacquer the particular one we use is this fridgeline and we use it not because it's ideal it's got a lot of drawbacks it uh, is very fragile if you handle it if you pack it with rolled up acid free tissue you can scratch it uh, it becomes embrittle with time so you have to take it off before 25 years or else you have to use some quite invasive methods uh, to get it off but it certainly does provide protection and it's really almost invisible on the surface so our curators were happy with it the other two lacquers i found they were happy with uh unfortunately then stopped being made at some point and that's a perennial problem with conservation most of what we use isn't designed for conservation if it's not selling well if they find something better they'll take it off the market and uh, what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is the work we've done to be able to predict what the lifetime of the lacquer is and how often we need to change it so as if we know if we have data for temperature relative humidity light from the room we can tell you how long that lacquer will last before you need to take it off uh, so what affects that lifetime as I've said the appearance is really important 
and what it looks like is uh, has been key in, the, in this use and what you often find as it begins to fail is you get these little white spots that you can see under a microscope but that's not usually what it happens first a loss of protection if it stops protecting the silver you'll need to change it and again that does happen but it's quite slow what we have found has been the real limiting thing for the lifetime is a loss of reversibility normally this is just taken down in acetone and after a certain period it will the lacquer will cross link and react to the point that you can no longer use acetone or if you use acetone there are residues and then you have to start using more and more aggressive solvents and eventually you'll need to start using things like a steam cleaner which is really uh, can be problematic with some intricate silver surfaces with gilding and things like that uh, and if you leave the lacquer on, this is the kind of effect you can have with the cross-linking. So as you can see, really the bush marks where the lacquer was placed, some of it's been taken off, some of it's cross-linked and stayed, uh, stayed there. And we did a lot of work uh, looking at this with experiments. And we found that if we did infrared spectroscopy on the surface, we could say how deteriorated the lacquer was just by the ratio of these uh, two peaks. When the lacquer's fresh, this peak is very small, this one's much bigger. As it ages, this gets bigger, that one reduces in size. So we can just ratio the two peaks and say how degraded the lacquer is. Uh, and this is some work with uh, heat and light aging with that peak ratio. And you can see after 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, it's getting bigger and bigger. And then the important thing is we can relate that to the properties. So as we can look at if, how much insolubility, what percentage of the film we can't remove after different uh, periods. And what that means is that by doing a quick analysis on the surface, this is uh, obviously not silver, but it's looking at a, a lacquer on a copper alloy object. Uh, with this instrument, we don't need to take samples, we don't need to take it to a laboratory, this is in one of our stores. Uh, we can determine how degraded the lacquer is, and knowing what environments it's going back into, how long before we'll need to uh, change it. That's a simple uh, case. Much more complex case was the centerpiece uh, that we had. And with this, we had the European Mobile Laboratory very kindly brought along a portable infrared spectrometer that runs down a fiber. And what they did was go along the whole length, 14 and a half meters, measuring every third acanthus leaf on this. And uh, this is a sort of spectrum we got not, uh, uh, that was good enough for this kind of analysis. And the kind of result uh, we get is this. So this is the ratio going along the length. And there's a window at one end. And we think the light is the reason why this side is slightly more deteriorated than this side. We have these interesting peaks. And we think they're related to a flood that happened from the room below that fell through the chandelier. And you can see there's a band of deterioration here and a band of deterioration on either side of the chandelier uh, that's caused that. So that's something we wouldn't be able to uh, predict without doing uh, the measurement. So it's giving that, given that information, and the conditions in the room, we were able to say that for that particular piece, we needed to do the conservation within the next five years. And we were very happy with uh, the lacquer up until last year. When this paper appeared, again at the Metals Conference, uh, and what it's basically saying is, when we do ODI tests and some room temperature aging with cellulose nitrate, we always see corrosion. And we see on the silver, this quite unusual white gray corrosion, and that is actually silver nitrate cyanide. Very unusual uh, compound. And the paper was saying, this means we should never, really shouldn't be using cellulose But I'd looked at lots of objects in the British Museum where we use lots of cellulose nitrate lacquers, all that one, and I'd never seen anything that looked 
like this. We'd done similar audit tests, we'd analysed this compound, but we'd never seen it on objects. So I decided to go back and look through all the analyses we'd done. Uh, we did a lot with this infrared microscope looking at the surface, and unlike most silver corrosion products, this one you can see in the infrared. So this is an infrared spectrum, lots of peaks, but what's really interesting is you've got these two peaks labelled as one and two, that nothing else really shows a peak there. So they're quite indicative. And I look back at our 500 plus analyses of objects and we've never seen a peak here, but they're quite small peaks. Maybe we'd miss something. And for the way we were doing the analysis with the microscope, we just bounced the infrared beam once off the surface. There are other uh, accessories that means we can do lots of bounces, which makes it more uh, sensitive. And we took 15 silver coupons, we put them out in showcases that were tightly sealed and had lots of lacquered silver on them. So as ones we thought we might see this if we were going to see this. Uh, the detection limit is down now at about 20 atomic layers. But again, on those 15 coupons, no sign of the silver cyanide nitrate. So again, as I said, we put lots of coupons out. We've done electrolytical reduction. Uh, one of my colleagues looked at a sample of the silver nitrate cyanide, kindly provided by one of the authors. And what we found is normally we get peaks uh, here for perhaps silver sulfide and silver oxide, etc. But there's a peak at 0.1, which is really quite unique to this compound. It doesn't exist for any of the other things we'd expect to see on the silver surface. So as we look back through the 200 analyses we had, again, none of the coupons are showing any silver cyan nitrate cyanide on the surface. And we think this is a bit more sensitive than atomic layers. And then finally, we went to SIMS, which, as I said, is about the most sensitive uh, thing that we have. Uh, we looked at 60 coupons, we couldn't find any silver nitrate cyanide or any silver cyanide on the surface. This is actually work I did at the British Museum about 20 years ago. At that time, we were allowed to look at a small number of coins that had been cleaned, that had had the lacquer removed to look at the tarnish. The curator decided that the small holes we were going to drill in the surface, which weren't visible to the naked eye, were acceptable for getting that information. And for nine of the coins, we didn't see anything. But for three of them, four of them, we did actually see a very small silver cyanide peak. And there's another group in the States that have taken bits of uh, lacquer off of silver and put them through the same technique. And they, again, have found some, but by no means all of their objects, a very small part of them has this silver cyanide. Now, what's interesting is the compound is supposed to be silver nitrate cyanide. And there's no peaks there that would belong to either silver nitrate or nitrate or anything that we'd expect to come off nitrate breaking down. So that's interesting in itself. And when we did the depth profiling, uh, this is what we saw. So the lacquer the tarnish layer is about half a micron uh, deep, maybe 5,000 layers of silver sulfide and the black bar on the right is the cyanide it is just on the very sorry on the left it is just on the very 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 surface of the silver and we know uh, we've done some other work to uh, calibrate this uh, profiling which is why it's got the depth on we know that's less than eight atomic layers i think that silver cyanide probably came from a cyanide based silver dip uh, at the British Museum, we did a chemical disposal from that workshop in the 1990s, and there was silver, a cyanide-based dip there. Uh, even if it didn't, even if it is the beginning of this reaction, there is so little cyanide there, it's not going to affect the optical properties, it's not going to affect the uh, chemical properties, uh, because it's only eight layers out of 5,000 uh, on there. 
Okay, it's probably a, a decent point for me to finish. I should just finish with some acknowledgements. Uh, Catherine Hallett, who's now at Historic Royal Palaces, but did a lot of the work uh, with me. Hazel Hunter, who did the electrochemical stripping. Uh, Richard Charter from Imperial College, who very kindly let us uh, get access to the Sims equipment and help with the interpretation. Uh, Marianne Odlier, uh, who gave us access to the infrared accessory and Boris Petzl to the infrared. Uh, my colleague Paul, who installed the pumps at Apsley and Osborne. And my colleague Naomi Luxford, who did some of the initial work on uh, cellulose nitrate aging. And that, I think, is that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. So if you are ready, we do have a few questions. Sure. With your permission, yeah. The first one is, uh, how far is the handheld XRF technique helpful in identifying tarnishing? Okay. Uh, it, I don't know that it's particularly Right. What it is very helpful is identifying exactly what the metal is, whether it's silver, copper, whether there's 91% silver there and 3% copper or, or whatever it is. For many of the tarnished layers, they're so thin and that technique, uh, again, will analyse maybe a micron of depth, maybe a bit more. The problem is there's not enough sulphur there to necessarily show up on the on the equipment uh, you will pick up chloride if it's above a certain level uh, it's been used for looking at uh, chloride in uh, iron uh, corrosion products but i'm not sure it's massively helpful for this if they xrf is used for silver tarnish but they tend to use a slightly different geometry that brings the beam in for at a much shallower angle so it makes it more sensitive if, if it's a very tarnished piece some of those images I showed at the beginning, you probably would pick, would pick up the sulfur and the, the chloride. Uh, but you're not going to pick up things like the oxide and the carbon species that we were, we were finding. Thank you. The next question is, what is the name of the instrument used for measuring silver tarnishing? You know, the one that you showed where there were two strips. Oh, yeah. I think that's uh, Vandana. Is that the one that you're referring to? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's called uh, Air Core. So it's A I R C O R R, or sometimes Muse Core, M U S C O C O R R. Uh, it's sold by a company in France. Uh, uh, if anybody wants to send me a. Yeah, David, can you please repeat the spellings? I'll type it out for everyone. It's A I R Air and then Core C O R R. Yeah, and the next one? The, the earlier version was uh, Muse, M-U-S, core. C-O-R. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, and that comes with different metals as well. You can buy it with silver or with steel or with copper or a bronze or uh, lead, so which is quite useful for other applications. Okay, thank you. The next question, I think it's on everybody's mind, is... Since we are approached by a lot of private collectors or people who just have silver objects, jewelry at home, and cannot, and uh, the, all of them may not have access to lab cleaning and proper storage. So some good housekeeping tips or simple measures that these people could, if you could recommend those, these people could follow to just uh, maybe reduce the tarnishing rate. Yeah, so, okay. Uh if it's an object that they're predominantly, you know, equivalent to having in store, uh, as opposed to something that needs to be displayed, the first thing to do is look at, you know, because quite often pieces of jewellery come in nice velvet bags or have settings. It's better not to use, things like velvet will speed up the tarnishing. If it's a dark blue or green or red or black, it will probably speed up the tarnishing. So. It's better to keep it separate. Uh, you could keep it, I mean, even keeping it in something like a sealed polythene bag would probably slow things down. Uh, if you can, you know, find an aluminium foil, that, that, that is even better. Uh, keeping silver at a lower temperature is better, which I know is 
maybe not uh, something you have much choice uh, with, but it will tarnish faster at higher temperatures. And then if you're going to have it, uh, you know, on display in a room, if you can keep it in a cabinet, that will probably improve things. Uh, and just having things like windows and doors closed as frequently as possible uh, will, will help uh, matters. Uh, yeah, I think they're probably the, the simple things that can be can be done. Um, what what do you recommend any type of coatings or any application that one can do on this is just from my side uh, that you can do on these objects to just give a permeable so to say a protective layer? Are there uh, any easy yeah. available coatings? It, it, yeah. It's the easily available is the it's certainly for, I mean, uh, paraloid works well, but you have to be in some of something like xylene, the more it doesn't work very well in acetone. You've got to use some of the heavier solvents. Uh, the, the frigiline, the cellulose nitrates work uh, very well if you can get hold of those. Uh, and, you know, certainly they're available in the UK. You can buy lacquers for your uh, pieces. Uh, yeah, but there's, I mean, there's not a lot that's necessarily easily available that would would work. But the, the thing is, if you know, uh, if you've got a little bit of time and you've got some pieces of silver, coat, you know, find what you can find easily, coat twenty pieces of silver with them, leave them side by side, and see what you know what works best yeah. in a year, yeah. two years, five years. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is the. What is the rate of success of lacquering uh, in <laughs> tropical countries? Uh, well, I, that I, I can't, I, I don't know, know the answer. Applying the, the frigiline that we use works very well. It has to be applied properly. And there were stories of people applying it and then it just falling off. Uh, so it's something that does take a little bit of uh, practice. I don't know if your conservation courses teach people how to, to lacquer, uh, but it's, you know, one of the problems with frigiline is it, it is not the easiest material to get to work, work well. I'm afraid I, 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 I'm not aware, I've not seen anybody talk about uh, applying lacquers in, you know, more tropical, hotter yeah. countries. In, in theory, it should work, uh, but I don't, I've, I've not seen anybody. Again, yeah. maybe it's good to test and see the performance of these. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is, uh, based on your findings about dust, have you altered your storage? Or do you have recommendations now against dust? Yeah. Do, uh, we, uh, do we want to store silver in closed boxes then, rather than open shelving? Yeah. I mean, certainly, Hopefully within a store, uh, because you don't have that many people in there, you may not have that much dust. Uh, storing things in closed boxes or the closed bags is certainly beneficial. Uh, I think the big thing about dust is maybe perhaps there's more you can do about it with display because how often you clean your floors, uh, and some things about how you set displays up can make quite a big difference to dust deposition. So, you know, if you if you ensure that your floor is clean daily, you'll probably get a lot less dust in your showcases than if it's cleaned once a week or once a month. Uh, and if something's on open display, having it as far away from people as possible and having it more on some kind of plinth that's maybe uh, 30 centimeters high reduces the amount of dust that falls on it uh, quite dramatically. So it, it certainly can be can be used for that. Uh, I mean, in stores, normally you don't have so much dust. So, uh, but it's always worth putting them in, in closed boxes uh, if you can, or even just putting, uh, you know, something like Tyvek yeah. over yeah. the surface or over the front of a shelf will help. Clean for the storage boxes or cabinets, what material would you recommend for silverware display? 
Okay, the first thing that's important is that the materials that the cabinet are made out of don't tarnish silver. Uh, so you, you know, if you've got the option, you can do an oddy test. If you don't, you could probably just put, you know, a piece of the material in a jar uh, with a piece of silver. Uh, you know, your summer temperatures are probably high enough to uh, yeah. cause cause things to tarnish. You could just test it simply that way. Yeah. What the material, you know, the materials are inert, and things like steel and glass are totally inert. It's wood, plastics, uh, etc. That ca can be a problem, not always. Uh, the thing is to try and get a cabinet that's as tightly sealed as possible, so is it, uh, you know, closes properly, and maybe the seals on there to, uh, you know, like a, a silicone seal for the door to to, to close mm -hmm. against. Thank you. The next question is, what should be the quantity of absorbent used in display cases? <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm laughing because that's a very common question. I know. <laughs> for silver, you, it won't work for most showcases if you just put an absorbent in. It will work for the desktop type showcases I showed, but you need to have the absorbent around the edges where the air is coming in. Uh, and generally with absorbents, the more pollute, the more absorbent you can fit in, the better. Uh, I've not really, uh, we have some calculations for the lifetime in pumps, which is a bit easier because you know how much air is going through it. Uh, and if you're interested in things like lead and acetic acid, uh, there's a paper that I've written, which I'll, I'll email you the reference of that talks uh, about about that but i say for silver uh in a showcase just putting absorbent on the shelves or whatever it's probably going to have quite a minimal effect i'm afraid okay thank you the next question is what method can be used to remove the cross-linked cellulose nitrate layers applied when they have degraded yeah okay so if they're a little bit degraded and not a lot, you can start using stronger solvents. So as you tend to go from something like acetone up to some, unfortunately, some of the more uh, toxic solvents like xylene or whatever will take it off. At a certain point, solvents won't remove it and you really are left with, uh, well, I suppose two options now. Uh, there are lasers if you have access, which, you know, they're quite expensive. Most people don't. Uh, and th there is a, a steam cleaner which uh, will take it off, but you have to be very careful of the surface that you're using uh, with that because it can damage silver. Thank you. The next question is, is cellulose nitrate coating sufficient to protect silver objects displayed in the outdoors? Uh, do we change the concentrations if you're coating uh, indoor and outdoor objects? Is there a change in concentration that is... That yeah, I, I've... I've never tried coating anything outdoors. Uh, I would, yeah. I I honestly don't don't know. I would expect you might. It it, it is affected by light, mm -hmm. so if you put it outdoors, it may well be that it, you don't get that much life out of it. Uh, there's a couple of other coatings uh, that may be may be better for outdoor use, but I'm afraid I've never been asked that question for silver we've looked at outdoor coatings for iron and copper and paints and things but not not for silver so sorry <laughs> okay thank you the next question is um frigiline lacquer is now not as adhesive to silver services as it was when it was made in cannings in the uk perhaps 20 years ago so do you know it, if its formula has now changed? This is Mr. Neil Bowen. I think he knows the product well. Yeah, uh, I, I would sus suspect the answer to his question is almost certainly yes. I haven't looked at it. When we were at the British Museum, we had an extremely good relationship with Cannings and they did at one point tell us exactly what was in it, you know, all 25 uh, materials. Uh, since I've left, I, I've not done that, but the, one of the problems that always comes about with using commercial materials is they can change and you don't know. Uh, could, could I ask, is this something that you know, see, you've seen in the last two years or five years or ten years? 
Neil, Mr. Neil Cohen, can you unmute yourself? Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? Neil? He's not there. He's there, okay. but maybe we can't hear him, so. Okay, because most of the work we did on this was about 13 years ago, so it, okay. it was a, an older uh, form, formulation. I've not, I, I will ask the question because we've had a, quite a lot of material lacquered recently. I'll ask if the conservators uh, that we use it have, uh, have noticed that, but uh, it, it, it's very likely that it, that it has changed, I'm afraid. Thank you. The next question is, can we use frigiline and wax together? as a coat right what you would hope would happen is so as you i think the sensible way would be to put the frigiline on first and then the wax uh on top of it and the wax may well protect the frigiline and give it a bit of a longer lifetime uh that's quite commonly used with uh a number of lacquers uh, i don't know for sure if it does but it, it may well do i don't think in an indoor environment there's probably no disadvantage of putting the wax on top uh, with outdoor coatings particularly paints we found that uh, renaissance wax can make the paint uh, deteriorate faster uh, than not not having it present but i think indoors with silver and frigidly that wouldn't be an issue but i don't know that it would you know i don't know for sure it would make it last longer but it, it may well well do Thank you. The, the next question is comparison between the use of activated carbon and the use of Pacific silver cloth that most of us yeah. in, in showcases to prevent silver tarnish. So the difference in performance. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, one of my colleagues at the British Museum uh, did a set of tests uh, in about oh, 95, uh, which compared directly the two. She compared them in a flowing air system, which I, should, I meant to get the, the image of, but she had lots of jars with air being pulled through a pump. So was the, uh, there was a long tube down to the bottom of the jar. There was a circle of the activated charcoal or Pacific, uh, and she tested lots of other, other things as well. And what she found was the activated charcoal worked much better in that, you know, kept the silver less tarnish for longer, than the Pacific silver cloth. I think Pacific silver cloth works very well as it was designed as a bag for an object. If you put an object in Pacific silver cloth, it will work great. Some people have found it works reasonably well as a, you know, putting on shelves or, or whatever. Other people have found it works less well. And I think one of the things we just don't know at the moment is why sometimes something works in one situation and in a very similar situation people report something quite uh, quite different so in those tests and they're published in the american institute of conservation uh in a paper by susan bradley uh which i can send you the link to uh, padma uh they they showed the activated charcoal work better than the pacific silver cloth for the air in the british museum and I suppose this is another point is different locations have a different mix of gases and perhaps that uh, influences how well some of these things work. Thank you. The next question is, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the availability of the corrosion intercept bags? That okay. Uh, they're very widely available in Europe uh, and the US. Uh, they, I mean, they're used they were designed for use by the military uh, so as they do things like even wrap helicopters in the the, 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 the foil so as i would have thought you should be able to get them somewhere uh, you know not too far from india if, if not in india but i i don't know you know, I, claire, I don't know. claire claire definitely is uh, she is based in the uh, UK, so I think she will get Claire. Is this clear? It's the family silver I'm bothered about, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I want 
I want to I want to make it clear, sort of, you know, not that I'm thinking of it, but can I can I sort of go into my um, cooking shelves and is, is it a specific aluminium? Oh, what? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Or, can, or can I just get out my alif oil from? Yeah, I'll, from I'll the um, <laughs> cooking department. So, the corrosion intercept is the co is the copper particles in a polymer. That's a different film. Oh, okay, if sorry. Want, if you want to have a barrier, your cooking foil will work. The problem is it's quite brittle and easy to tear. Okay. And the uh, uh, you know this this stuff has a basically a polymer layer either side. If you only want small amounts of it. Quite often things like uh, crisps, chips and whatever, the food bags are this kind of bag. Mm. Right. So as it could be, you could just wash it off and and use it if you're happy to have whatever mm. logo. Yes. <laughs> no, I, 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 I just, you know, when in a tight, a tight corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, absolutely. And, and the, the foil works well. I've even seen with the this Marble Seal or Moist Stop, which are two brands of it, Quite often it's used and it's uh, ironed onto the uh, baseboards of showcases. And I've even seen at CCI, they use aluminium foil and a plastic bag, which I guess is getting more difficult to get hold of these days and just iron the aluminium foil on. So it will certainly work, but it is quite easy to damage, you know, to tear it or damage it. So you really have to sort of pay attention and keep, um, keep looking at your stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, but, yeah, but I mean, you know, if you put it in, it's not going to get damaged in there unless people move things around or or, or whatever. But it, it it will certainly certainly work that work uh, work as you know the barrier's the same. It's just because it's not got the polymer either side. You know how easy it is to uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. The next question is: What is your opinion on the immersion method? That is using baking soda and aluminium foil as reverse tarnishing. Yep, uh, it certainly works. Uh, the drawbacks, I suppose, of it is the how much control you have over the process. People would argue that maybe with polishing, uh, you know, you can ha perhaps have a little more control. It depends exactly how you're doing it. Uh, I mean, I don't think, you know, you'd need to be very careful with gilded surfaces and uh, anything else on the, on the silver, but, 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 but it, 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 it certainly, certainly will, uh, will work. You just need, need to keep a close eye on it. And I guess the, uh, it only works in contact with the foil. So you do have a bit of control over where, 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 where it happens. Thank you. <laughs> Neil did get back, he says, probably five years. The question when you asked how long? Yeah, so five he, years. I was didn't that. get that. Sorry, it says probably five years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, I think maybe we might. Uh, well, I'll certainly ask people about what's that, that what that's happened. But it's happened with several other products that we use in conservation in the past, and it wouldn't uh, surprise me. But unusually, that's a lacquer that's sold mainly for what we want to do with it. So is it may be possible to, uh, you know, influence canning to take it back, even if it's maybe a little bit more expensive. But you know, if we say, well, look, we're we're prepared to pay the extra to get it as 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 good as it, it was. But I'll, I'll certainly ask people that have been doing it for us what, okay. what, what they think. Uh, um, Mr. Neil Bolin, uh, would you like to join? Or is it? Are you there? Okay, I think that answers this question. So the next question is the reference for the BM comparison. Uh, you said you'll be giving it to me. So Anjali, I'll be sharing it with everyone who's registered, not an issue with that once I get it from you. So I right. think, uh, any other questions? I think that's all. Thank you so much for your time and patience, David. I think we're almost, uh, it's almost, one and a half hours, as, as I said. Thank you so much for a lovely talk. I think it was very interesting. We got a lot of tips, especially on preventive conservation of silverware. A lot of thank yous. I think everybody did enjoy the talk. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Everyone for joining us. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>